the economic outlook for the year 2013, what is going to be like? Have we been able to achieve the successful economic growth results as expected following the end of the conflict in Sri Lanka? To discuss all this and more, we have with us this evening the Governor of the Central Bank, Mr. Ajit Nivar Kabral. A very good evening and welcome to this first and foremost, uh, Mr. Governor. Good evening. Starting off, Mr. Governor, you took over the reins as the Governor of the Central Bank in the year 2006. What has been economic performance in the island over the last six years or so? When I look back, I think I'm looking back with some satisfaction because we have come a long way in the last six to seven years. Mm -hmm. At the time that we came in, our reserves about $2 billion. Our unemployment was high. Inflation was high. The um, country was in a state of um, uncertainty. Mm -hmm. The war was going on. Uh, huge uh, complications because there was not much of interest of investing in Sri Lanka. That has changed today. If you look at the situation today, we have inflation in single digits for the past 50 months. The longest ever that we have had before that was only 23 months. We have in the last 50 months enjoyed a single digit inflation. Our reserves are at a comfortable $6.5 billion. We have seen our unemployment coming down to the lowest ever levels of around 3.9%. Mm -hmm. Our uh, debt to GDP ratios are about 80%. In 2002, it was as high as 105%. So we have come a long way. And through that journey, we have also had strong growth in the last two to three years. We have had 8% growth, 8.3% growth, and 6.4% growth. A period which is not in any way surpassed by any other period in the country. So these, when I look back, I think uh, there has been uh, plenty of achievements which we need to be uh, happy about. But at the same time, I would be the first to admit that we need to keep this momentum because it's not easy to keep an economy going with the same kind of resilience and the strength all the time. It needs a lot of energy. It needs a lot of uh, investment. It needs investment both from the government as well as the private sector. It needs the improvement of the infrastructure. It needs the macro fundamentals to be on a very benign level, continuous basis. So we are looking at dealing with all those challenges. And, I think, uh, and, I, and I think when we go ahead on those lines, you would probably find that we are on track to deliver the promises that we have uh, made. Mr. Governor, for the end of the conflict, people expected there to be a boom in the economy. In 2010 and 2011, as you correctly mentioned, we did achieve over 8% economic growth. However, in 2012, according to the Census Statistics Department, the economic growth had a downward trend. It took 6.4% last year. What is the reason behind this, Mr. Governor? <coughs> I think 6.4% when the entire world is growing at 1% is not a bad growth. We've got to be also un be able to understand that there are times when we have to move very fast, mm -hmm. sometimes when you have to take a little uh, step backwards sometimes, then maneuver the bends. When you are doing a race, Shamir, you will go at 100 miles an hour in the straight, but you won't do the same at the bend. You'll have to slow down. So we are interested in maintaining the overall stability of the economy. There are times when you need to slow down. And last year was a year of that nature where we deliberately took some steps to take that turn so that we are poised for a better outlook thereafter. And that is the reason why we had to take a cut of our growth. But that is for a good reason. We found that we have now positioned ourselves on a very sound macro platform to be able to enjoy a 7% plus growth from this year onwards. And that's, that takes a little maneuvering. So I think um, people will appreciate when they look back that uh, it's not just 1% uh, growth that we have to talk about as being a reduction. It is the long-term growth. It's no use saying, you know, we made 7.5% growth uh, in the year 2012 and after that have a huge downturn thereafter. It is necessary to keep a momentum. And that, I think, is uh, the essential factor that we need to understand. And if you take the two years after the end of the conflict, both years were above 8% growth. That is the first time in our history that we have been able to deliver that kind of a growth. So it means that there has been a good uh, movement, but at the same time, we have to take some measures sometimes, and then we have been bold enough to do that. Mr. Governor, by the end of the year 2013, the central bank predicts to reach or achieve an economic growth of 7.5%. However, the International Monetary Fund is of the opinion that the, central, that the Sri Lankan government can only be able to achieve 6.25% economic growth. How do you view this notion? 
who is in a better position to understand our economy more than us? You see, if you go to another country and then you are making predictions, you will have limited scope to deal with. We have all the information and we have also seen what investments are coming into the country. So we take a very, very um, overall call on that. Of course, these are predictions. The IMF, if you remember, uh, changed their growth forecast of the world four times last year. So these things can happen because you are taking certain assumptions, you go on a certain basis. There may be some instances where things can change. We also have predicted the growth of 7.5%, but tomorrow if there is a huge upheaval in the world, where there's some major crash or some major earthquake and there's a slowdown in the economic uh, drivers of the world, or you find the oil prices going into some different uh, range, mm -hmm. there can be problems. But you've got to understand that there is a certain basis on which we make our predictions and our forecasts. Can you tell me how much your sales would be in the year 2015? You'll tell me, but at the, I can't hold you to it fully. Because it is an estimate that you are making. In the same way, we are working with a large number of variables in a country. And then when you do that, there will be certain instances where there will be some which will be more than what we had predicted, some which will be a little less than what we had predicted. Uh, Mr. But, Mr. Overall, you would find, but overall, you would find that we take a, a call which is professionally done and uh, we uh, are doing that in a, in a, in a bona fide manner. Uh, Mr. Government, does that mean that the central bank does not agree with the economic outlook of the International Monetary Fund? Of course, if they don't uh, agree with our figure, uh, we stand by our figure. And if you look at the history in the last several uh, years, you would find that we have come out uh, with our figures at the right level more, more times than they have. So this is the uh, way it works. So, uh, uh, you know, what I can't understand is they are saying 6.5%. Or we are saying 7%. What is it that uh, there is a huge disagreement about? They are both predicting that there will be overall growth. They are both predicting that it will be a growth between 6.5% and 7.5%. So there is not much of a divergence. So I think we need to move forward without getting involved in these tiny little areas and having a huge uh, conversation about those matters. We've got to understand, they are also saying that there is a reasonable growth could take place and work on those fundamentals and work towards achieving those. This is not the government's growth. You mentioned about the government's growth, Shamir. What you have to understand is this is the country's growth. This is not government. Mm -hmm. Government measures it through the Census and mm -hmm. Statistics Department. But all of what you do, including your networks, the farmers, the big business, the small timers, the SMEs, all of them put together, they are product. The gross domestic product is evaluated through those means. So that is what we need to understand. So we need to keep that energy going to see that all of them are working hard towards achieving those goals. Issuing a statement recently, Mr. Governor, Fitch rating says that the Sri Lankan economy possess a risk because it does not have any ties with the IMF at the moment. How do you view this, uh, Mr. Governor? There is no economy that has no risk. If you take even the world's largest economy, the US, it faced a tremendous risk when they were talking about the fiscal cliff, when they were talking about uh, the um, debt crisis. All these are risks that they all have. Every economy has some risk. Today, Europe is having ma major risks that they have to deal with. In the same way, we also have risks. Our job is to ensure that these risks are managed. There's no business that is without risk. There's nothing at all that is without risk. We have to first of all understand that. So when the pitch rating says that, we need to take it in that spirit because they are also highlighting certain risks that are there, which we ourselves know. So, how do you deal with it? So, you deal with it by mitigating the risks and managing the risks. All the risks that have been highlighted, we have been able to manage and we continue to manage those. But some things take a little more longer time than others. And some things will have to be dealt with on a medium term framework, time framework, and some on a longer term. But we've got to move towards it. I'll give you one example. In 2002, Shamir, 
Sri Lanka's debt to GDP ratio was as high as 105%. That means if our economy GDP was 100, our debt was 105. But by last year, it has come down to about 80. 80 is also not a number that we are satisfied with. But you cannot have a magic wand which says 105 will become 65 overnight. It is a gradual process which you need to work on. So we are dealing with all those risks. We are dealing with inflation. We are dealing with uh, the uh, unemployment risk. We are dealing with the, uh, with the uh, trade imbalances. So all these have to be managed. And I think uh, Fitch also recognizes that we are managing it in the right way. That is why our uh, ratings have stayed neutral when in many other countries in this current turbulent times it has been coming down. Uh, Mr. Governor, when you really look at the last 65 years uh, since independence in Sri Lanka, since 1948, the government has been able to have a very clear, very good track record with international institutions and other countries with regard to debt. However, since of late, the Sri Lankan government has been borrowing a lot of money from commercial banks. You saw that in the recent past for high interest rates for a very short period of time as well. How can you sustain the economy? By going into such loans, uh, Mr. Governor. I just mentioned to you about the debt to GDP level. That is the most important yardstick. Now, if that is coming down, what does that say? That says that your debt levels in relation to your GDP is coming down. That tells us a story. That is, we are now on a better position than even if we had in the past. So the very fact that you are saying that we are borrowing is a good thing because we are still managing it in a very prudent manner. And you see the development. We are not borrowed money to uh, eat bread like what we did in the past. There was a time in Sri Lanka when more than $600 million was borrowed over a period of time in order to buy wheat and eat bread. Now, would you be more satisfied that by doing that or by building an airport or a uh, power plant or a, new a highway which will generate some new avenues of business as well? Now, that is where the difference in the policy has worked. I think we need to recognize that, Shamir, that there has been a clear focus of the development objective, and that objective has been at the forefront of economic development. Now, in the next few years also, there will be some elements of borrowing that will take place. But we are ag here again, we have to also understand that Sri Lanka is no longer a poor, impoverished country. There was a time when we were known as the least developed country. Now, when you're a least developed country, what happens? You get grants, then you get long-term loans, and you get various uh, handouts of that nature. But when you come into a position like what we are, we are today, where today we are known as a middle-income, emerging market nation status country, when you come to that level, then you no longer qualify for those handouts. So then you need to do your own uh, uh, commercial activities, you have to support your infrastructure development through commercial loans, and which we have done. But there, no commercial organization is going to give you loans unless they are satisfied with the viability. So, the, in this debate, what we have to recognize is also that there are people who are lending who are at more risk than the people who are talking. Mr. Governor, are we investing in the right entities? When we look at the past few years, we see the manner in which the government has invested a lot in the service sector and not in the sectors such as agriculture. Do we think that we can really move into productive levels to increase productive levels in such a backdrop? I don't think that is correct to say that we haven't invested in agriculture. If you look at the plan that has been executed in the last five to six years, it has been a holistic plan. In agriculture, the mistake that we had made in the past, Shamesh, was that we only did ad hoc changes in the agricultural trust. But if you look at the Mahindra Chintan and the way it has been implemented in the recent past, in the last six years, it has covered all the ingredients of agriculture. The land, the water, the seeds, the farmers' um, know-how, the funding, the storage, the transport, the uh, harvesting. All those ingredients have been covered in one holistic plan and that has been implemented. That is why today we are self-sufficient in rice. We have got a huge uh, plantations of uh, vegetables. That is why even in the highest levels of uh, drought and floods, we have been able to keep our inflation at these reasonable numbers because there has been a steady flow of agricultural produce. Those days you would have remembered a few years ago, many five, ten years ago, 
Every time there is a drought or a flood, there is a huge crisis in the country. This time we have had huge floods and huge uh, uh, drought, droughts, but there has been no such crisis. Prices have fluctuated, no doubt, but price fluctuations have been limited. So there has been a good uh, uh, focus on agriculture, and I think the Divina Guma that is being implemented now uh, will address some of the other shortcomings as well. And I'm fairly confident that it will uh, deal with many of the issues that we have had to deal with in the past and that we will see a better trend in agriculture. Will we be able to see a significant growth in productivity levels in Sri Lanka by the end that, of this That's year? a very good question. Productivity levels are low in our country, particularly in the agricultural field. So we need to work on that. And I, I take your point that we need to address that. If you look at our roadmap uh, and you see the, um, the uh, productivity levels that have been improving the last several years, you would find that services and industries, the Sri Lankan productivity levels have improved quite uh, well. But it has been rather flat with regard to agriculture. So we have to accept that. But at the same time, it has happened uh, because of some other factors also, we have to understand that. So it has not decreased, uh, but it has not increased appreciably either. So that tells us that there is scope for us to improve. And I think one area that we need to focus on is that of um, uh, fisheries, because fisheries is an area that we can improve without m many limitations. Agriculture, there are certain limitations because we have to, have to have the forest cover, there is urban development that has to be provided for. So the agricultural lands that can be utilized is limited. But in the case of fisheries, there is a huge scope and I hope that uh, the government as well as the private sector will now embark on that. But um, in the meantime, we will have some scope for improvement in the agricultural area and I believe that uh, some of those issues that you highlighted will be addressed through the Divinaguma department as well and I know that there will be some new impetus also created for that development. When we look at the fisheries sector, Mr. Gavin, you see a kilogram of scraps going for 1,200 rupees and since the end of the conflict the government has really failed to uh, have the opportunities available in the fisheries industry. Do you agree with me when I say this? I think uh, we are getting mixed up if you think of fisheries as only the spread prices for a week. You see, we have to look at the whole picture. Fisheries is one of the important uh, areas through which the protein of our people is being sub uh, is provided. Mm -hmm. And that is taking place. Malnutrition levels have come down, especially uh, the fisheries that has taken place in the north and the east has improved tremendously. But we do understand that, we do understand that there may be instances where fats can go up or salaries can go up. So I think we need to now become mature. We've got to understand that uh, there will be some instances where there can be changes in prices. But that is not to uh, label the entire industry of saying that, you know, that this uh, industry is in trouble. There is a huge amount of work that is taking place. You're talking and about uh, we will see that in the, in the next few years, if we go through this thrust, especially the inland fisheries as well as the coastal fisheries and the deep sea fisheries are improved, we will see some major changes and I am very, very conscious that that is an area that will have tremendous scope and uh, someday we will see these changes. Mr. Kavan, you were talking about inflation. Last month, inflation recorded the number, the figure stood at 9.8%, the highest when compared to the recent past. Do you see a downward trend in the future as far as inflation is concerned? Yes, we will see a moderation this year, uh, this month. Uh, and uh, as we had predicted, in fact, this first two months of this year, we had, we had said that it will be a spike in, particularly because the base was very low, uh, Shamir. The last year, one of the lowest levels of inflation was recorded last year in January and February. February was only about 1.2%. And after that, there was the price adjustment that came in for the petroleum, uh, and there was an increase in the inflation. So the base became slightly higher from March onwards. So from March, we will see a moderation of the inflation numbers from this year. So it was not something that took us by surprise. We were fairly con uh, uh, clear that this would happen. So that's why uh, we didn't uh, react unduly for that uh, change, because it was very well expected and it uh, happened in line with the expectation.
brought you in association with Basic Media gives you the speed and the technology like no other institute in Sri Lanka. Sima, the next generation qualification, the passport for a global career. Uh, Mr. Governor, one of the allegations leveled directly at you is the fact investing in wrong entities as far as the EPF funds are concerned, which is the largest fund in Sri Lanka. How do you view these allegations leveled at you personally, uh, Mr. Governor? You see, we have one of the best investment teams in the EPF. And if you look at the overall returns that they have generated, you know it's one of the best in the country. It's, it has done much better than unit trusts that have been uh, uh, able to generate much lower returns than the EPF. So these are all allegations that they are uh, uh, making because they know that we are doing well. The EPF has done very well. At one time they were screaming about some other investments that the central bank has made. Then we showed that the central bank investments have been the best in the world in that year. So you can always find one particular area. Let's yes. talk about the Greek bonds, uh, Mr. Governor. What went wrong there? So Greek bonds ha didn't give the same return that we had expected. But did you know that we made $430 million that year? when even the Fed Reserve made only $410 million. Do you know that the return that Sri Lankan Central Bank gave of 6.6% .6 was the highest in the world? Most of the other central banks were getting 1.2%, 1.3%. And we made 6.6%. .6 Why don't people talk about that? Are they shy to say that? That Sri Lanka did the best in the world? Are they... Uh, they don't like to give us credit for that? So they harp on one item where it has been not as we expected. But there were so many instances where it had done so well. But they don't want to talk about it. You also asked me about Greek bonds. But you saw that Sri Lanka had done the best in the world last year. But you never want to ask me that question. Why is that? We need to get our mindsets changed now, Sandesh. You see, we got to understand that we are investing in a very, very difficult environment. And if in that environment, we as professional people have been able to deliver a very good return, acknowledge that. Say that it has been doing done well. I think that we need to now get our minds into shape to be able to appreciate the Sri Lankan investors. And even in the case of the EPF, it is the same thing. Our returns have been higher than most of the other long-term uh, investing uh, entities. And no one wants to talk about that. They will talk about one or two things, and they'll make a huge story about it. And they are reluctant to say about these things. That's why I'm particularly pleased that you asked me the question because it gives me an opportunity of telling what I have to say. And I think we now need to move from that mindset. We need to have a different attitude. We need to understand the context of investment. And if you understand the context of investment, then you will realize what a challenging job it is. And in that challenging job, when people take decisions, they will take an overall view. There will be some instances where you have a certain element of your portfolio where you invest in higher risk areas, some on a lower risk area, but all with a design to be able to give that return. And that I think we have done very well and I will be able to meet any challenge or any criticism on that. Uh, one of the regulations that were put forward by the IMF during the standby arrangement was the fact that the rupee has to be left to float. The dollar rate has to left to float. It has to not be put a cap, <coughs> uh, Mr. Governor. And you saw the manner in which uh, the president of the country during his budget speech also made it very clear that the rupee has to be left alone and not be, uh, the dollar has to be left alone and no cap is going to be put on pl in place. Are we acting based on the whims and fancies of the International Monetary Fund, Mr. Governor? <laughs> very interesting question you're asking. Have a look at the LOI, the letter of uh, intent that you have signed with the uh, IMF. You will see that every letter of in, uh, intent talks about the Mahindra Chintana and the plans of the country. There has been nothing that has been done which is against the overall thrust that we ourselves have committed ourselves to. And we are very clear about that because I myself have gone through those documents very, very closely and we structured those in line with our own plans and there isn't a single area where we have uh, agreed with the IMF other than with a program that has already been articulated by the 
finance ministry and the central bank. So we are very clear about that. There was nothing that was imposed on us from outside. We explained our policies. One of the problems that we have had, Shamir, in the past is that we had no plan when we went to the IMF. So we had to take whatever they say and we said, okay, we'll do that. This time round, even at the time that we went in 2009, we had the basic structure already set in motion. We said, this is our plan. This is the way that we are hoping to move forward. This, these are the steps that we, we intend taking. So they were very clear about that. So they said, okay, you go ahead with that. So if you look at the uh, letters of invention, and I would be asking everyone to go through that carefully, you will find that it is exactly in line with the mind that and the medium term policy framework that we have ourselves articulated. So there was nothing strange in that. So we're not working on the whims and fancies of the IMF. And I can very, very uh, categorically assure all your listeners that we have done it exactly the way that we had committed to the country. And that is something that we are very proud of because we didn't uh, bow down to any dictates of anybody else. And we were driven by our own plans. Uh, Mr. Governor, in December last year, the central bank revised its in, uh, policy interest rates. However, this is not really reflected in commercial banks. What is the reason behind this? That's a good Mr. question. Actually, we are also a little uh, disappointed that the transmission has not occurred as fast as we think we thought it would. Uh, in fact, we have spoken to some of the banks uh, who have uh, uh, not responded to the policy rate uh, revision that we have done. And I think um, it's a matter of uh, time before it happens. And if you notice, in many instances, it's like the normal commodities. If you increase the prices, the price increase is passed down to the customers very quickly. But if you decrease prices, or with a tax revision or something, you'll find that the price revision does not go to the consumers as fast. Similar things are there with the banking sector also. We are alive to that. We have spoken to them, and I think it will be a matter of time before it changes. Uh, Mr. Governor, China and India are becoming economic powerhouses in the region. Is the central bank, is the Sri Lankan government taking leverage on the situation? Of course we are. If you see, take both countries, China is one of the larger investors in Sri Lanka. They have been investing quite uh, seriously in our infrastructure. If you see, notice the, uh, just a few days ago when we had the airport that was um, commissioned. The construction was done by the Chinese contractors. Uh, funding was through the Chinese government. So there has been a pretty close association with China, particularly in the field of investment. And we have also seen Chinese involvement in uh, the newer projects as well, particularly in the power sector. So we are satisfied with the situation there. Then in the case of India, we have seen India also being one of our biggest trading partners. Of course, we would like to export more to India rather than import only. Mm -hmm. uh, imports are fairly strong from India, and that is taking place. There's also the free trade agreement with India, which uh, provides the private sector the opportunity of exporting to India at a, without a duty as well. So this is another advantage that our private sector needs to take advantage of. So we have uh, done what it takes to set the platform for the um, connection between both India and China. And we, I think, uh, would see that taking place on a larger scale as our own per capita incomes rise and our own economy starts developing further. Mr. Governor, can Sri Lanka be made the miracle of Asia by 2016, as predicted, even by the President? Of course. I'm very bullish about that. If you see the way foreign investors particularly look at Sri Lanka, uh, you will find... That, that is certainly the uh, feeling that they also had. If you take Ruchit Sharma's book, which he wrote about breakout nations, he devotes an entire chapter to Sri Lanka and talks about how he sees Sri Lanka moving forward in the next few years. If you look at some of the major investors who have been invested in Sri Lankan paper, they are very, very bullish about Sri Lanka because they can see what is taking place. If you look at the numbers of Malaysia in 1993, you will find that their own macro fundamentals were very similar to that of Sri Lanka today. I would like to uh, tell people to have a look at that. And the way Malaysia has progressed thereafter is also similar to the plans that we have. It may be a coincidence, it may be by design, but we have also taken the necessary steps to pitch Sri Lanka to that level. So I believe that is not lost on many investors, both in Sri Lanka as well as outside, and the strong 
level of investment that is taking place is as a result of that feeling that is generated. And I'm confident that people will see this uh, getting more and more. My final question to you, Mr. Governor. 2013, where will Sri Lanka stand? I think we will be able to achieve a higher than 7% growth. Uh, we will see our macro fundamentals stabilizing further. We will see the some of the major projects that are presently in the pipeline finishing, which adds new uh, elements of um, uh, elements of um, uh, economic activity to our country. We will find that our doing business indicators are improving. You would probably also see that uh, we have undertaken some of the uh, necessary elements of change with, with regard to CPC and CEB, which will also bring those institutions to a more viable position. You would find that our banks will become a lot more consolidated into dealing with the issues that we will have in the next few years. We will also see that our per capita in incomes will rise beyond the $3,000 mark, which ensures that our uh, spending levels as well as our consumption levels will improve. Uh, and I think we could look forward to a good year of stabilization in 2013. And thereafter, we would be then well positioned to reach the $4,000 per capita income before the year 2016. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gavin, for joining us right here on the Focus. Thanks for having me. Thank you.